Now that we've already mentioned the star schema quite some times, we want to dive a little bit deeper and understand the star schema a little bit more. Because this is basically the most important schema in our data warehouse, especially in our data marts. So we've already seen that we arrange and structure our data in facts and dimensions. So in our case, if we have a look at this example, we have the sales table, which contains all of our important facts and we can create relationships. So using the foreign key and the primary key to create those connections or joins to our dimension tables. In our case, the product table. And these are then for example, looking like this. So we have our fact table with our foreign key that enable a relationship or a join to a primary key of our dimension table. And in this case, we have a one to many relationship usually between the fact and the dimension table. And this is referring to the fact that we have the one side on our dimension table. So we have every single value in the column that we use for the connection, so it's the product ID, every single value occurring only once. So every value is unique and that's why we have this one on the dimension side. The n on the other side is the many side. So n means many and this is referring to the fact that for this connection in the product ID, so that's the column that is used, we have the values potentially occurring multiple times. So some values are occurring multiple times. So for example, in this case, the three. And what we also note for this star schema, since we have only one level of hierarchy, so we have only one connection, and then from here, there's not any other connection starting. And that's why we can have some data redundancy because in this case, the category column is basically another level of hierarchy. And in here we have, for example, garlic and banana, and they are both in the category fruits and vegetables. And therefore this value is repeated. And basically this is a data redundancy because values are occurring twice, which would theoretically not be necessary. So we can see later on in the snowflake schema an alternative that is reducing this data redundancy. And this reducing of data redundancy is called normalization. And in this case, since it is not fully normalized, it is to a certain degree denormalized. So we have seen normalization is good for some cases, but it is not ideal to get data out and have a good read performance on our operations as well as a good usability. And therefore we can accept this data redundancy because it is in our case better for what we want to do with that data. So again, normalization is a mathematical technique that is reducing the data redundancy. And with that, we have lower storage costs. So we minimize the disk space needed for this data. And this has benefits in terms of write operations. It makes it easier to maintain and update data. But since in our case, we want to usually read the data and we have specific visualization use cases, this is not necessary and not ideal if the data is fully normalized, because in this case we have many tables and more complex queries because we need to do more joins. And this is bad for performance then also again, and also it is not so user friendly. So this is normalized versus denormalized. And in our star schema, the data is to a certain degree denormalized because we have this data redundancy. And here is an example of a practically implemented star schema. So in the middle, we have the sales table as a fact, and then around that, we have our dimensions. In this case, this is made in Power BI, but of course there are other tools. And we can also see in here that we have physically created those relationships. So they are between the 
dimensions and we see also dimension is the one side and then the star is resembling the many side of the fact. In some cases we have some special cases where we have two fact tables. Ideally we want to define one grain so we do this and we'll talk about the process of creating our data warehouse later on. But in the beginning, usually we define a grain. This is what we can do. And then we should get all of the facts into one single fact table. This is of course the ideal situation and also maybe the most common situation, but sometimes it is not possible. And in that cases, we can have multiple facts and then all of the relevant dimensions can have in this case two dimensions. So for example, the product hierarchy, if this dimension is relevant for both facts, it can have two dimensions. And usually the fact tables then don't have a connection with each other. But again, this is a more complex case and we don't want to start with the most special case, but first we want to understand the general model and then later on we'll dive a little bit deeper into some variations and some common data modeling challenges that we can face. So to summarize that, a star schema is the most common schema in a data mart because it combines both usability so user friendliness and high query performance. It is also the most simple form. So this is especially compared to the snowflake schema, which is a little bit more complex. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And also note that a star schema is specially optimized and ideal if we have specific needs. That means we know what set of queries are usually run. So for example, we know it's very common that we want to visualize just the profit by the year, the profit by the categories, and we don't need super complex queries. And in such cases, if we have those more simple and more defined set of queries, set of needs, we have the best performance and the best usability with our star schema. And therefore, since we have these benefits, it's the most common schema in our data mart. So this is what we need to know about the star schema. But now we have already mentioned the snowflake schema, which is another variation. And this is what we want to talk about in the next lecture. Now let's talk about the snowflake schema. Theoretically speaking, the star schema is a special case of a snowflake schema. So a snowflake schema is the more general concept because it allows for multiple levels. So basically a star schema is a snowflake schema with only one level in the hierarchy. But even though this is generally or theoretically true, a star schema is much more common actually. But now what is a snowflake schema? So in this case, we have seen that we have some data redundancy in our star schema, which again, we accept for the usability and also usually better read performance. But in our case, if we want to use a snowflake schema, these redundancies, which is written out as text, can be reduced by just keeping the ID, so the number, which takes much less disk space, so much less storage, than all of that written out letters. And then all of the related information to the category, we only need to have stored once, which again creates a second level of a hierarchy. And this now resembles not a star anymore, but it looks more like a snowflake. And again, this is where the name of this schema is coming from. And in contrast to the star schema, the snowflake schema is now also more normalized. But now let's compare the snowflake schema to the star schema. What are the differences and also what are the benefits and downsides of a snowflake schema? So let's start with the advantages and then we'll also talk about the disadvantages. So again, since we have 
no or at least less data redundancies we have less disk space used so this can reduce our storage cost because if we have millions or billions of rows and data points this can reduce the amount of space used and then if this is a relevant factor for us it can reduce the storage cost and also for this less redundant data, it is easier to maintain or update data. So the risk of corrupted data when we want to update data is a lot lower because the data is now only usually in one place and we have not all of these repeated values, which makes it easier to update and maintain data. But actually, since in a data warehouse, we usually want to get data out in the end, this is not such a big advantage. But also it can, as mentioned, solve some write slowdowns. And if we need to frequently update the data, then this can solve these challenges. But then also on the other side, this is much more complex because now since we have the data more normalized, we have more tables and it can just get more complex to understand where is all of the data available. We need also more joins to join the tables, which can again be more complicated, more complex. And due to these joins, also the performance is usually then lower because then also compute power is needed to make these joins and to scan through the tables. So this all results usually even in a lower performance in our data marts and also of course a lower usability. And therefore a snowflake schema is not what we usually want to use if we can avoid it in our data mart. In our data mart we usually therefore want to go with a star schema. So this is usually the better option than the snowflake schema if it is possible in our case. And then in the core it is also usually the better option to just model the data after a star schema. But if we have really some problems with some write operations which makes it difficult to maintain or if the storage cost in some very rare cases can be a challenge then we can also use the snowflake schema in the core but then of course we have to do a little bit of remodeling to load the data and the data mount which can be possible and can be okay but as mentioned the default in my opinion should be to go with a star schema because it has the most benefits for our use cases but still I think it's good to have this concept of snowflake schema understood so that you know what it is if you happen to see it and that you know what you are talking about. In this lecture we just want to make a quick practical demonstration of how we can create a snowflaked dimension out of this product table that we can see in here. So this should be just a quick demonstration and later on of course we can do that not only in pgadmin with SQL but we can also do it in ETL tools. And this is just a very basic example that should just give you a quick demonstration of how this could be done in a practical way. Of course later on we can do it also with an ETL tool in Pentaho and also I want to note that this is of course not a SQL course and therefore it is not dedicated to teach you every single SQL step. But we'll try to keep it as simple as possible so that you just have a good demonstration of how this works. And don't worry if you don't understand every single code. So therefore what we want to do is first we want to get this products table in our database as a separate dedicated table. And then out of that products table we want to create a second table and that would be our category table. So we need to do some very simple transformations and we want to have then of course this column category in our categories table but all of these values should be unique of course. So let's see how we can do that in a practical way. First what we want to do of course open up pgadmin and then from the databases we can expand that we want to open up our public schema. So our public schema we can then right click on 
And here we find the option query tool. This will open up this window where we can now create our SQL code and we can then execute this code to, for example, create tables or update columns and so on. So what we then want to do is you find this text file in the resources of this lecture. You can copy all of that and paste it all in this query editor. And now step by step, we can execute this code. So first we want to create our products table. So we can do that using the command create table, then the table name, and then all of the columns with their associated data type. So we have this table with four columns. As we can see also in here, we have these four columns. So they are respectively the same columns. And now we want to, of course, highlight everything. And then we can press F5 on our keyboard or also just go on this play button to execute that code. And of course, now I cannot do it again, but it has been created, which we can see if we right click on the public schema again and then we click on refresh and now in our tables we see this product table. We can now also see and query from that table. So we go to select star from products, again the play button and we see the table is existing, it's there, but of course there's no data included yet. And therefore we now want to import this CSV file and have it also as a table then in our database. So that's what we are doing next. We do that by right clicking on the products table and then we need to search for import export data. And here we can now just change this option to import and then we need to search this file. Of course, this file is again attached to the resources in this lecture and you need to go, of course, to your own file path. So you need to know where have you stored and downloaded this to and then we just need to navigate to this location. So we can do that by just clicking on this little icon and then we find this table products. So now we can select it and then the format is CSV. This is okay. Here we can search for UTF-8 and then also we have headers included in this file. The delimiter is in our case a comma and all of the rest we can leave at the default settings. And then the next step is the columns. So in these columns we see that there could be already some columns pre-filled but if this is not the case you can also just go ahead and select them all manually. So these are all of the columns that are in this table and they can be all selected. And now we have this all done, so we can now click on OK. And now we get this message that it has worked. And I want to also make one quick note. Sometimes we get a problem with importing CSV files and this is oftentimes related to the binary path. So if you want to change that and you have this error message, just go to File, Preferences and then find the binary paths. In here we need to scroll down to PostgreSQL binary path. And in here, if you are on a Windows machine, you need to search in Program Files. So you can just go to these three dots and then search for this. So you can go to the Start and then you need to just navigate to program files, then Postgres, PostgreSQL, and then to your version, and then you select bin, and then you have, so we can basically go one step back, just select it, and then we are good. We just need to save that, and then you should be good to go. And now, after we have imported this file, we can query again, from our products table and now the data is visible. Of course it can be not so clean in some cases or we can also later on have some transformations that help to clean that data. But in our case this is now fine and we have another goal. What we want to do is we want to create a separate table with the category and this has of course a different hierarchy.
So what we could do is we could just select the category column from this products table. And we can use also the keyword distinct to make it distinct. So if I don't use this keyword, we just see all of the entire list. So there are still the duplicates included. We have just selected that column. But now if I use this distinct, I highlight everything and press F5. I have now this list of distinct values for the category. And now what we can do is we can just using the into command, write this table that we have seen or get returned here into a separate table. So this will be then the table also called category. And then we can also just execute that. And now it has been returned. We can refresh our schema. And then we will see that now there's also the category table. And now, of course, we have, if we select it, we see that the data is in there, but usually we should have also an ID, so a category ID. And this can be created, for example, using such a SQL command with row number over by and then order by the column that we want to order by. So in this case, we just want to use that same column as the order. And of course, note that this is usually done also in our ETL tool, which we also later on have a look at. But for now, we just want to simply execute that command. So we see now this column is included. And of course, now we can also rename that column and put it in the beginning of our table. So if I do that, we see now it looks like this. And now we can also write that in our table. So we again use the into command. And if I execute that, of course, I get the error because this now already exists. But we can now also just in our case, use a second table and copy that into our category table. So this was basically just serving as a little helper table here. So therefore, let's execute that command as well. And now if we want to use the command and query from the table, select star from, so select star means select everything. And then we have category table and we press F5. We have now created our own dimension. And of course, we now also in our initial table, so our product table would have to replace also all of these category values. So again, this is something that we can do with the category ID. Of course, this is again something that can be done later on in the ETL tool as well. But as we are just starting with the basics of the dimensional modeling, we will see a lot more examples later on. And that's what we want to do now. So now that we have gotten this introduction into the dimensional modeling topics, we now want to dive deeper into the different types of facts and dimensions. And that's what we want to do in the next section.